When, when he said he had two minutes, Javier sitting here goes, that stinks. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, this has been good. It has been good. I, I just praise God for all the good things he's done. Let me just real quickly say thanks to everybody who's made this happen. Mike and Carrie uh, are over all of our carries and over all of these things. But man, there has been an army of people working day and night and uh, just thanks to everybody. It, it smells good. I know that many of our staff are out in the hallways putting things together, but if you are staff here at Andrew Mac Ministries of Caris Bible College, could you stand as well, even if yeah. you're a student? <laughs> Amen. You guys are amazing. Thank you guys Amen. so much for all you've done. And then when you see the staff out there in the hallways, just make sure to thank them. They have not only been preparing and have been working this, they have been praying over you. They have been praying for what you were going to receive from the Lord. So praise God for that. And again, thanks to Mike and Carrie. You know, it's, uh, I've, our ministry is larger than it's ever been. We're doing more things than we've ever done. And I've got more time off than I've ever had. <laughs> And it's because of all of our staff. I, it's just awesome. Amen. It's awesome. All right. Well, we're going to take some time here. So we have some questions that you guys have asked. And uh, we're going to ask Andrew Womack. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the questions was, who, who's your favorite teacher at Karis? I, I can't answer that. I love them all. And you know, this is one of the things that makes our ministry, I think, unique, or not unique, but, but good, is the fact that every single person contributes something. And if we were all like me, this would be a very boring school. And so we, we all together, we fit. And so, honestly, I love them all. Amen. I hadn't got a favorite. I love all of them. Amen. Okay, so um, I know we've been talking about, um, uh, for those that are, you know, here and praying about Karis, but the, one of the questions is, what is the key to timing? We talk about timing, that um, they said, I want to come, but it's not the right timing. How do I pre prepare for when the time is right? Well, I would say that if God has placed something on your heart, you start moving in that direction. And if you've got, you know, we don't deny that you've got a house to sell and that you've got a business that you've got to uh, get somebody to take over and things like that. But I'm saying start moving in that direction. I often say that if you put motion to your boat, well, then the rudder can direct you and stuff. But if you're sitting still, you can flip that rudder 360 degrees and it doesn't do anything. So just start moving in that direction. Start telling people, start making plans and God will show you. And it may take you a period of time to get something done, but I wouldn't just sit there and wait on something to happen. I would start moving in that direction and God will make it clear whether it's now or if it's next year or something like that. And I know um, I've met a number of um uh, attendees that are there are 14, 15, 16, and they've said, oh my gosh, I really want to come to Karis. And, you know, I, I spoke to one the other day and I said, well, by the time you get here, we're going to be even better. We're going to be even bigger. We're going to be more awesome. And Barry's going to care less what you think because um, he's going to be older. And so... <laughs> There is something to add. The older you get, you just don't care. <laughs> it's like people want to reject you and say, I've been rejected before and I survived it. So it doesn't matter. Amen. And for young people, you can get such an identity in Christ that you also just don't care what people think. Amen. But for our young, um, uh, or for our youngsters in the room, uh, can I just tell you, we have so many things that could prepare you for when it is the right time. I know some of you are finishing high school. We've got our Karis um, University series. We got Relationship University. We got Leadership, uh, excuse me, Healing University. We're just almost finished with Leadership University. Plus all of the biblical worldviews, I would encourage you. In the next couple of years that you are finishing up high school, 
put that stuff inside of you. If you could put those things inside of you before you come here, you will be Amen. white hot, on fire, Amen. focused, be some of our youngest, best on fire students we've ever had. If you would make the commitment to not wait two or three years to sow into your relationship with God, but do it now. Amen. 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 Okay, so uh, one of the questions is, my spouse is fine with me coming to school, but doesn't want to attend himself. I really want us to do this together. How do I convince him it's important? <laughs> Man, you have to have a word from God on that one. There isn't a just one thing you do and it works for everybody. It depends on your relationship with them. We've actually had people come to the school where they came to school and left their mate back home thousands of miles away. And I, when that first happened, I said, man, this can't be God. I just don't believe that God would do that. And did you know that a person came here for two years and their marriage increased and it was better. And I mean, after the fact, I saw a follow-up. And so it can happen. You can do anything for a brief period of time, but... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's tough when you're dealing with a mate. Mm -hmm. You know what I always uh, encourage people to do is you just, you just do what God tells you to do. Love them, respect them, tell you that you love them. And uh, over in first Peter, uh, or is it first or second, first Peter chapter three, I think where it says that if the husband won't be won uh, through the conversation of the wife, then you can win them without a word as they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So you can just be an example, but you're never, you're never going to improve a situation by compromising what God tells you to do. So you need to do what God tells you to do. And even your mate, you cannot control them. I actually saw a teaching one time that said seven steps to, I forgot the exact, seven steps to making your mate serve God or something. And I listened to it and it was witchcraft. You don't have the authority over your mate. Now you can sanctify them, 1 Corinthians 7, that means set them apart. You can release uh, God's touch on their life, but ultimately you can't control your mate. And anybody who tells you you can't control your mate, it's a witchcraft. God doesn't control anybody. He holds your self-will uh, sacred. And so you just do what God tells you to do and don't be apologetic about it. I've actually told some wives before that, you know, they, they are always leaving my tapes around. They're dropping hints. They do stuff. And I can't say that you can't do that, but you don't need to try and manipulate and coerce your mate. If you would love your mate with all of your heart, I think that Jesus would shine through so much. They would want what made you the way you are. Amen. And that's probably the best witness you could do. So kind of following that same question, um, this mom writes, I want my children to attend Karis. How do I make them want to come? Tell them you'll pay for it. <laughs> no, really. We, you need to exert some control. You can't control them once they graduate from school and once they get out on their own again. You can't control them, but you ought to really impress on them. Uh, I tell you, our school systems are just, they're bad. They're bad. And I know some people say, but there's Christians in there and they're believing God and trying to make it better. That's like saying that that um, band on the Titanic was really good. <laughs> Just because there's some Christians in there that are doing the best they can. I tell you, our school system is corrupt. And for you to send your kids there is nearly uh, criminal. I mean, it's bad. You need, to, you need to do something different. So I would encourage your kids to come to here, even if they have to go to a secular school because they've got to get some kind of a degree that we don't offer in order to fulfill what God called them to do. They ought to come here first and get grounded because the statistics are that like 80% or more of Christian youth renounce their faith after the first year of college. It is toxic. It stinketh. Amen. <laughs> And if you go around something like that, you're going to stink. So I didn't just encourage them. 
So um, many of our first year students, can I have our first year students give out a shout? All right. So we have some first year students have asked me, I've changed so much in first year. Should I, should I come to second year? I mean, I've changed already so much. Should I come back? So second year, what would you say? So why should they come to second year? That's like saying, man, that was really good, but I don't know if I want more good. I think I'll just go back to, to the bad. No, you, man, you can't get too good. Man, it's okay to be a spiritual glutton. You need to come back. Matter of fact, when the Lord told me to start this school, I was opposed to a, a Bible college because I'd seen people who graduated from it and I had a lot of material and I thought a person, if they were really motivated, could just get the, the truth, you know, through that. And I didn't see the need for a Bible college. But when the Lord spoke to me in 1993 over in England, uh, the second year is different. It is really practical. There is a lot of practical application. One of the major things is you have to go on a foreign missions trip. And there is a difference in just receiving and then having to give out. And I mean, we make people go in. There, this one guy, I don't know remember, if you remember uh, Tom Decker. Yeah. You remember Tom Decker? But Tom Decker, he was an oilman and he retired and came to school. And they just looked up on the internet and found that there was a Bible college in Colorado Springs. And so they came. They had never heard of me or anything. And they came and Tom was the biggest introvert. He made me look like an extrovert compared to him. And he, I mean, for two years in school, I'd say, how are you, Tom? And he'd shake his head. He never even responded and said a word. He was just so quiet, but he got hold of the word. And on his missions trip, I think they went to Kenya or Uganda, one of those African nations. And we put him in charge of a service a guy who wouldn't even talk to you. He was, he had the service and he was there by himself. And so he had to take the things that he had learned and speak it. And I wasn't there, but he told me about it. And he literally got up and just started speaking. The power of God fell and the entire church, hundreds of people were laid out in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he couldn't even get them to come back up. The pastor was out of it. And so Tom just left, <laughs> left the entire congregation. But he got so fired up that when he came back, he got in front of me and Linus Lefevre, the guy who was the director at the time. And he says, man, I've got to do something. What can I do to help you? And we had just had the director of our UK school quit. And so Tom and Leslie Decker moved over to the UK and took that over and for two years ministered in the UK. And I mean, that's what happens in the second year. You, it's important that you get your, your doctrine right, that you, have, you believe the right thing, but then ultimately it's, you got to put it into practice. And that's what the second year is about. It's real practical. And then the third year is even more uh, because what we do, we go into specific areas like Carrie heads up the DTP, Discipleship Training uh, Program. And that is specifically for people that want to help start a uh, Karis Bible College someplace in the world. We have a government school. We have worship arts. We have uh, film and production. Business, we, and business and ministry school. We got, what is it, seven or eight different tracks. Seven different tracks. And you get laser focused. And I mean, we got one guy that graduated from our business school. Samuel was his name. And he was from Uganda. And he took the first two years, I believe, in Uganda, but then he came here because uh, the, biz the third years are only offered here. So he came here. And when he went back to Uganda, they had a contest uh, over all of Africa. And I forget the exact number, but it was like 23,000 people or something applied for this grant. And Samuel, because of what he learned here, he put in his... Uh, Project and it was chosen out of 23,000 people in Africa. He won and got a grant. And he now has a farm over there with multiple tractors. I don't know how many people, dozens of people working for him. He's supplying food. And he's told us specifically, he says, it's because of what I learned here. 
And did you know one of the reasons that we make you go through the first two years before you go into the third year is because we don't want people just learning business or uh, government or something like that, but not having the character and not having the right heart. That's not what we're about. We aren't trying to just get people to prosper financially. We're wanting them to prosper in their soul and then that will produce prosperity. So when Samuel went back, his uncle offered him all of the money that he needed if he would renounce Jesus and become a Muslim. And because Samuel had already been through the first two years, he decided if that's what it takes, I won't do it. And he just stood. And then this uh, contest opened up and he won it. And today this guy is prospering hand over fist and doing things because he had the first two years under his belt. He wouldn't compromise. And so... Anyway, it's all good. You ought to come for three years. And we got, we've got some people that have come for four and five years because mm -hmm. they want more than one third year track. Amen. It's really good. So is the goal for someone coming to Carries is the goal for them to become a full-time minister? No. For those of you, it's to help you fulfill whatever your calling is. And if your calling is to be a full-time minister, then yes, then that will be one of the things that comes out of it. But we need people that are in the marketplace, just like this Samuel that I was talking about. We need people, you know, I've got 1,100 employees and many of them, they clean the toilets and they clean the floor. And many people would think, well, they aren't in ministry. I guarantee you, they are in full-time ministry. We could not do what we're doing without every single person. All of the people that are in our productions, all of the AVL people, all of the people that are answering questions, that are facilitating the students. You know, one of the things that Carrie and Mike have been super uh, good at since they took over the school. How long have you been doing that? Uh, seven years. Now. Seven years. And since they came in, one of the things that they did, the, the uh, material is good and all of that, but we didn't have the student services. It wasn't a good experience and they have just been going out of their way to make the experience better and better and better. And because of that, it makes the people receive much better because their mind's not occupied with why isn't this working and stuff. So every single person that works in this ministry is in full-time ministry. We could not do what we we're doing without them. And so people need to lose this concept that you aren't a minister unless you're on the stage. Man, I tell you what, if we didn't take care of this facility, God would not give us other facilities to trash. I believe that how you steward something is directly uh, related to how God will increase you. And we try and do everything we do with excellence. And the people that are cleaning the toilets and cleaning the floors, that this is just as important as everything. And uh, we try and instill that in people. So God, it'll make you a better husband. It'll make you a better wife. It'll make you a better parent. It'll make you a better person working in a, in a business. It'll, it'll just change your life. There's nothing that uh, you do that this wouldn't help you do it better. Amen. And we need people in every one of those areas. Amen. Well, what if, um, what if someone doesn't know what they're called to? How about you answering some questions? <laughs> I can easy. answer, but you know, Carrie, man, Mike and Carrie are just doing a wonderful job. And what would you say? I should have asked an easier one. No. Well, I think that the thing is, is that you won't know who God made you to be until you know who God is within you. Amen. And so it's, that's why there's such an emphasis on find, then follow, then fulfill. You got to find out who you are. You got to find out how God made you. That's why so many of these uh, lessons this week was about you, was about you getting the word. And, and that's for even current students, you know, because sometimes people come to me even in second and third and you're like, I still don't know what God wants me to do. You just keep pressing in and falling in love with Jesus. And then what happens is your fragrance uh, is going to continue to open up doors. And so if you don't know the Lord, you don't know who he is with inside of you, then I guarantee you're constantly distracted with what you want to be and what God wants you to be, what you want to be, because you've never truly surrendered. And so I think that's one of the powerful things about being in the word. You learn who you are. And then when you graduate, and so we always talk, Mike and I always talk about this, that when you graduate, we, we wish we didn't have to give you diplomas. 
Instead, I wish we could give you birth certificates. Because I'm telling you, you're just getting started. That's right. And so we have some students, you know, we, one of the questions is, you know, how old is too old to come to Karis? Well, you're never too old to follow the Lord. Amen. You're never too old to, to throw it all in and say, here I am, Lord, I'm, I belong to you. So we've had 70 and 80 year old graduates that are now so productive in their life. They said the last two and three years since they've graduated, they've been more productive in the last two years than they were the decade before. Amen. And I'm just telling you, when you get into the word, that's what it does. It just, it causes a life to be birthed inside of you. You know, the thing that got me to seeking the Lord was trying to find out what God's call for my life was. And m most of you have heard me say this, but Romans 12, one and two is what God spoke to me. And that's what changed my life. And one of the things he showed me through that was that God's will for my life is not being a minister. God's will for my life is to be a living sacrifice. And that's what it's all about. And then how he uses me once I'm yielded to him, that's actually secondary. That is not the main thing. So when you're talking about how do you find God's will, God's will is for you to be completely yielded to him. That's what Carrie was saying. Mm -hmm. And this is what Karis does. It shows you how much God loves you. It shows you who you are. It shows you what your potential is. And it helps you to become a living sacrifice. And then once you do that, uh, you would have to rebel at God to keep from finding his purpose for your life. He will orchestrate things and things will work out. So, uh, man, you know, you don't have to know what God's will is, what his vocation for your life is. You just come and get to know God, mm -hmm. fall in love with him. And I guarantee you, you'll leave here with more purpose, more direction than you've ever had. It will stir you up. It's like, I think what the word does is it just draws you back it's like, you know, a bow and arrow when you get, God's drawing you back and he's preparing and preparing and preparing your heart. There's lies that are falling off. You don't stink as much. Amen. There's all those things that happen. And then when, when it's time, again, that release, you're heading in the right direction. Do you know exactly all the details? No, but that's, that's one of the joys of getting into the word is that you no longer have to know all the details. You no longer have to have the control of when and where and how and how much. You're just ready to be released into what God has for you. And you have faith and confidence that when you land, you're going to catch things on fire. Let me use this illustration. If those of you that are old enough to remember when you had film and you used to take a picture, what they did, they had emulsion that was on that film and it had all of the different colors in there. And so everything that you need was already there, but when you exposed it to light, varying uh, rays of light have different uh, wavelengths on it, and it would, it would not put anything new on that film. What it would do, it would penetrate and draw out the colors that were already there, and that's what made the picture. Yep. When you took a picture, it didn't put something on the film. What it did was penetrate and draw out the stuff that was already there. And so every one of us already have everything that you will ever need in your spirit, but it has to be exposed to the light of God's word. And it just draws out of you what's already there. And this is what the Bible college does. You're sitting under the word for four hours a day, five days a week for two or three years. And I guarantee you, it will take what God has already put in you, what he wrote in his book, before you were even born and it will draw those things out. And you would literally have to fight to keep from having God stir you up and show you what your purpose is. Mm -hmm. You can do it. We've seen some people do it. I don't know why. I don't know why you'd come to Bible. We've had people that sign up and come to Bible school and pay for it and don't even come to class. What's the point? <laughs> and then we have other people come and sleep through class and stuff. So. You can do it, but if you just give it half a chance, I guarantee you the Word of God will change you. We had this guy named Taj. Did you ever know Taj? He's a class below me. So Taj was a black guy from the inner city of New York. And when he came, the very first, he wore FUBU stuff. FUBU, hat, shirt, everything. I'd never heard of FUBU until Taj came. <laughs> and anyway, Taj, he told me the first day, he says, I don't want to be here. I am not going to receive anything. But his mother was a partner of mine 
And she, uh, you know, this goes along with one of those other questions. How do you get your kids to come? She, she told him she would rent him an apartment. She bought him a car and paid all of his expenses if he would go for just six months. And so he told me when he came in, he says, I don't want to be here. I'm here to get the car and all the other stuff. And he was a nice kid. He didn't have a bad attitude, but he, he just did not want to be here. And he told everybody, every time you'd talk to him, I'm, I'm only here for six months. And did you know, after being here for six months, he went home and he went back and he found out that two or three of his friends had, had been killed. He was in a section of Chicago where they had a person killed in that area every single week. And he went back and tried to plug back into his old friends and he couldn't do it. He had been changed and he didn't even want to be changed. He didn't come here to be changed. And so he came back and finished school. I remember he was on our, our first missions trip, uh, I think over to uh, the UK and we went to Arthur Burt's place and stayed there. And Arthur Burt was an associate with Smith Wheelsworth, used to travel with him. And Ta has just asked some of the most awesome questions. And, and it was amazing. And now the last I heard, he's pastoring a church down in Colorado Springs. And all of this happened through a guy that didn't even want to be here. So if you'll want to be here, it'll work better. But even if you don't want to be here, if you would just come and sit there, I think 90% of you would probably get changed without trying. it would work. So um, March 23rd is the 55th anniversary of you being in full-time ministry. Congratulations. That's awesome. Amen. And... You know, many times you said that the whole reason starting the school and the teachers say this a lot so that we don't have to learn from the hard knocks. But say you were a brand new 20 something year old Bible college student and you were starting all over. What would be the most important thing you'd want to learn if you were coming to Karis? Well, in hindsight, I can tell you that. But when I was 20 years old, I didn't know what that was. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're young like that, you don't know what you need. But now I can go back and I can, you know, look at my life and tell you what's the most important thing. And I would say that for me, I had this experience that lit a fire on the inside of me. Emotionally, I was motivated. So motivation wasn't my problem. But the most important thing that has allowed me to last for 55 years is understanding who I am in Christ. My identity, which you were talking about earlier. And, and this is really a focus. I know that Mike and Carrie, this is one of the things, if you listen to them very long, you're going to hear about relationship, about your intimate relationship with the Lord. And this is, this is what God did for me. And when I found out who I was in Christ, it allowed me to break out of my, my flesh because I, I had a personality that was introverted I was shy and all of these things and I felt captivated or captured by it. I couldn't break out of it. And when I found out that I was already everything that I ever wanted to be in the spirit, I was already that. Man, it just set me free to start walking in the spirit. And I didn't even try and change my flesh. I just started operating out of who I was in Christ. And now, it, you know, I've taken these personality tests and stuff. And when I take them, I test out a 10 out of 10, maximum extrovert. And yet I used to be just exactly the opposite. And it's finding out who I was in Christ that allowed me to do that. And so that would have to be the number one thing is my identity in Christ. It's what set me free. Amen. And that's one of your key courses in first year. Is and right along Christ? with that was the word of God. Because if I hadn't have exalted the word of God and begin to start trusting what I saw in the word of God, I wouldn't have ever accepted who I was in Christ. So I'd say that the emphasis on the Word of God and your identity in Christ are the two most important things I ever got. So you're writing some um, booklets right now. So of kind of encapsulating the last 55 years of like key revelations. So what are some of those first key revelations and what is your biggest revelation right now that God's doing in your life? Oh man, that's a big question. Again, I don't, uh, I don't know that I can say what my biggest revelation is. Now, it's like all of the things that God's shown me. I'm trying to juggle all of those things at one time. So I'm not focused on one thing. 
But Mike uh, Pickett, we were in one of our executive team meetings and I was saying, we need to do something to celebrate. This is major. And how could we get our partners and people to recognize this? And Mike's the one that came up with, he says, why don't you start just talking about the major revelations that God has given you and share it with others. And so I was in Cancun two weeks ago and I spent a whole week, I wrote about 30 pages of stuff. And I, it's still, uh, I've got, I don't know how much, a lot more to go. But I, I just started thinking about what were the revelation? It's the, it's the truth of the word of God that makes you free. And so I actually went back 65 years to when I was eight years old. And the first revelation that ever really hit me was about hell because my pastor preached a sermon on hell. And it just shocked me to, he was saying that good people don't go to heaven and bad people don't go to hell. It all depends on whether you accept Jesus. And there's going to be good people by the world standards that go to hell. And there's going to be bad people by the world standards that go to heaven because they accepted salvation. And that was important. But the thing that really got me, and this is something that uh, I don't think most people who even speak out and try and counter lies and the unbelief that's in our world, most Christians that do that don't get specific enough to really drive the point home. They, they're apologetic. And so one of the things that this pastor did, he started naming names. He was naming people that I had heard of eight years old people that, you know, were on shows, movies, people that were singers, people that were politicians, names that I knew. And he started calling their names. They're going to split hell wide open if they don't repent. <laughs> Most people won't do stuff like that. But see, if he'd have just presented a general truth, that might have interested me. But when he started calling names of people that I just thought, no, they would never go to hell. Uh, boy, that got my attention. And so I didn't respond at church that day, but when I got home, I asked my dad, I said, man, what is this? Uh, and he began to explain to me and show that we were all born in sin. And I mean, my dad, the second revelation was he told me that it's not what you do. It's not the good go to heaven and the bad go to hell. It's, what, it's whether or not you accept Jesus as your savior. And he explained that to me. So my second revelation was about that it was all based on what Jesus did. And the only part I had to play was just to either believe and receive or doubt and do without. And when he shared that with me, I got born again right there in my bedroom with my dad praying for me. So those two revelations are what really started the whole thing. And then when I was uh, 18 years old, is I had become a religious Pharisee because I went to church and they basically were telling me that God will answer your prayers and love you and move in your life proportional to how holy you are. And so I determined I was going to be the holiest person that ever lived. And I mean, I've, I've lived a holy life. I lived holier than anybody I knew. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that I honestly tried serving God with everything I had. I'd have given up bubble gum if I'd have thought it pleased God. I'd have done anything. I was seeking God with my whole heart. And, but I began to start trusting in my goodness. And because I was doing better than anybody I knew, I honestly thought I was awesome. <laughs> and I looked down my nose at other people. And what happened on March the 23rd, God showed me his glory and, you know, compared to people, I might look good, but man, when, if you ever get a revelation of who God is, uh, you'll repent in sackcloth and ashes. There's many scriptural examples that every time the glory of God was revealed, people just uh, hated their own self-righteousness. Self-righteousness, I believe, is a worse sin than adultery, homosexuality, murder, than anything else. And I was totally self-righteous. And so when I saw that, that was really good for me. And I don't, I think this is why a lot of ministers don't make it is because they don't have a knowledge of who they are without Christ. They see, who, they see who they are in Christ and man, that's essential. And I'm certainly supportive of that, but you need to balance both of these things. 
Isaiah chapter 59 verse one says, those of you that are seeking after righteousness, look to the rock from which you are hewn. That's Jesus. And look to the hole of the pit from which you are digged. You're supposed to be looking at both of those things. You need, you know, again, I'm saying this just to brag on Jesus, but look at the good things that Jesus has done. And man, I'm just so thrilled with what Jesus is doing, but I constantly remember that night. And I can guarantee you without Jesus, I'm a big zero with the rim knocked, knocked off. I'm a nothing. And I think that really, really helps me to keep my feet planted on the ground and give God the glory and stuff. And so anyway, we could just keep going and going and going and going. And I've now got about 15 or 20 of those revelations like that, that have shaped my life. And I've probably got 30 or 40 to go. So which one's most important? All of them. There's not a day that goes by that I don't remember March the 23rd, 1968. And I remember that, man, I thought God was going to kill me when I saw how ungodly I was. And instead of killing me, he poured his love out on me. And man, I've never gotten over that. I have never gotten over that. I remember that every day of my life. Everybody needs to be able to look back and remember that it's, God, just like this up here says, it's the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. And if you ever forget that and get to, you know, just focused on what's he showing you right now. Well, he's showing me things right now, but I'm going back to the very beginning. You got to keep all of those things in play at all times. I believe there's going to be revelations for those that are coming and those are already here. There's key revelations that God is wanting to reveal to you that are just as life-giving and significant. I know for me, honestly, when I was in Bible school, the biggest revelation I got, and again, I grew up in Pastor Lawson's church. And so, you know, when he was up here yelling, oh, he really yelled when I was a little girl. He'd rip off his coat and run across the front row, <laughs> spitting. It was amazing, okay? And uh, you never fell asleep in church. Um, but you know, when he talked about, you know, I am blessed, I'm blessed coming in, I'm blessed going out, I'm blessed in my health, I'm blessed. I remember hearing that all my life growing up and hearing, you know, the finished work of the cross. But it was actually when I came to Bible school that I learned intimacy with God. I'd had this great relationship with God. I'd had this great, you know, dynamic of being in the word, but it was during that time I got a revelation of what it meant to have relationship with almighty God. And when you get those revelations, they stay with you for the rest of your life. And I just want to challenge you. You don't want to miss those revelations. You don't want to miss it. And so even for those of you that are already students, it's how you come to here as well. You're coming expecting revelations that are going to change your life. Amen? And I've heard you, Carrie, talk about when you were in Russia. And man, she went through poverty. She went through rejection. Here she was a single woman over there in a society that didn't really appreciate women in <laughs> ministry. And you could just name thing after thing. And it was that relationship mm -hmm. that kept her going. You, you can't get enough knowledge to sustain you. Knowledge is important, mm -hmm. but it just opens you up to relationship with God and stuff. It's how, we wouldn't know how to spell Jesus if it wasn't for the Bible. <laughs> and so you need the knowledge, but this knowledge leads you to relationship with the Lord. And Amen. that's what you're talking about. Amen. And that's a strong point. I've heard Carrie minister many times and she will always, Amen. always bring something out about relationship with God because that's what it's all about. Yep. You know, uh, first Corinthians 8, 1 says, knowledge puffs up, or maybe it's 8, 2, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Amen. Knowledge is essential. Mm -hmm. But if you just stop at knowledge, you, you're going to be nothing but a sound in brass and a tinkling cymbal. You need to have an intimate relationship with God. And we can't just impart it to you but we're going to model it for you and tell you about it so often that if you're listening, I guarantee you it'll change your relationship. It's awesome. So in our last few minutes of this Campus Days 2023, how many of you have been blessed? <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for answering these questions. But as we, as we finish up, what would be your parting word? Parting word to those who are thinking about coming and to those who are already here having placed themselves in this environment. You know, when Joseph, 
uh, Pastor uh, Lawson was talking about Joseph and when Joseph finally revealed himself to his brethren, he told them to go back and get their father and all their families and come back. And then he says, and see that you fall not out by the way. These people had been against him. There was a possibility that they would go back and never come back. And he says, see that you don't fall out by the way. If God has spoken something to you, just see that you do it regardless of what it costs you. And I can guarantee you that Satan is going to try and uh, make you think that, man, the effort that it's going to take and what about my finances and this? Just if God has spoken something to you, do it. If it hair lips the devil, do it. Just do it. And this is an attitude that I have. Once I know that God has told me to do something, I'll do it. I don't care what the results are. And uh, I know that some people say, well, that's easy for you to say. Well, it's really not easy for me to say. I've been through things where honestly, when we started on television, God told me to go on television. And yet it was way beyond me. And we made commitments that if God didn't come through, our ministry would have been over in uh, January of 2000. And I mean, I rolled the dice in a sense. I put everything I had into it. And if, if I hadn't heard from God, it would have totally destroyed the ministry. And I could name dozens and dozens and dozens of times like that. And so once God tells me to do something, I just do it. And I encourage you to do that. If God has spoken to you, just do it. One of my teachings that I have that I, I like the best, very few people request this. It's one of my least requested teachings is uh, the four keys to staying full of God. And it's based on Romans 1, 21. And there's four things that you do to walk away from what God has spoken to let Satan steal it from you. And the first thing is you don't put the right value on God. You don't glorify him and value what God says. And uh, anyway, I, I've got a whole series on that, but you need to put value and not think that this is just emotional, that we got you here and it was the music and it was the beautiful mountains and it was this and it was just emotional. If God spoke to you, you need to drive a stake in the ground and say, this was a word from God and in the name of Jesus, I'll never back off of it. And that you gotta have that attitude. Uh, Mark, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12 says, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven is preached and it suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And you got to get violent to where, you know, once God has spoken to you, I'll, I'll do this. If it costs me everything I've got, there is no turning back. You got to burn your bridges behind you. And I can say that Jamie and I, if we would have had any quit in us, we'd have quit a long time ago. Carrie, when she went to Russia, she had lots of things happen. If she would have just been trying it, she wouldn't have done it. Right. You just got to say, God has spoken to me and I will get it done. And you don't have to do it perfectly. Amen. You can mess up along the way and you can make mistakes as long as you're still heading in the direction that God gave you. You don't have to worry about doing it perfectly. He doesn't demand that, but, he, but you do have to continue. When the disciples were told to go across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it's only a two hour trip across there. I've been on the Sea of Galilee in the Jesus boat is what they called it. And we anchored in the middle of the sea and I taught for two hours about all the things that happened right there. But anyway, it only takes two hours to go across the Sea of Galilee. They left at sundown and in the fourth watch of the night, which means it was between 3 and 6 a.m., they were only halfway across because the wind was blowing against them. And that's when Jesus came walking on the water and they experienced that miracle. Everybody wants to experience a miracle. But you know, if the wind was that much against them, all they had to do was turn that boat around and head back to shore. And they could have been at the safety of the shore in just minutes. And yet like nine hours later, they were still moving in the direction. They weren't real faith giants. They were scared to death, but they were committed. And because of that, the Lord came out and they experienced that miracle. You don't have to do everything perfectly, but just once God speaks to you, do it and don't quit. If it kills you, do it. <laughs> Amen. I'd rather die trusting God than live doing it my own thing. You know, we said this before, God, God didn't create you to be ordinary. 
Now he, he created you for his spirit. And I just want to give you one last verse as we wrap up today. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19, God uses this scripture to speak to me on a lot of things. But he was speaking and he said to the children of the list, he said, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He said, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Do you not perceive it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Amen. I think that's the thing. When God's starting to do a new thing, you and I have to recognize, okay, God's doing something. Versus like, shh, 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 God, shh. Let me do my thing and I'll come back to you when I'm ready. When God starts doing a new thing, when he starts stirring up something new in your heart, one of the biggest things you and I have to do is perceive it. That he's doing a new thing. Does that mean we know how it's going to work? No, because he says that he will make a way. He will make the road in the wilderness and he will do what? And rivers in the desert. So he provides the direction and the path and the provision and the sustenance. And so I'm just going to encourage you, don't, don't look back to the former things. Don't go back to the former ways you looked and smelled. Amen. Because God has something new for you today. Amen. Amen. And I know there's many of you, this is, we have things that we're going to be doing this afternoon that are powerful. We have our Karis night of worship tonight. This is going to be powerful. Okay. You know, we did this, this every morning. Try that this evening. Oh my goodness. So guys, I'm going to encourage you come back because it's also in worship that the Lord's wanting to speak to you and solidify. So please join us. We're having our Karis Fair next door. And so go there, check it out. I believe there's going to be some divine appointments of God making a road in the wilderness and streams in the desert. He's going to show you when and where and how and how much. And so please go check that out. But and let me pray. I want to pray for two groups. I want to pray for those of you who aren't sure whether you're supposed to be here. And then I want to pray for those of you who are sure and just agree with you. So first of all, let's have those of you that are still debating. You haven't made a decision yet. I want you to stand and we're going to pray. And if God doesn't want you here, we don't want you here because we've had some people here <laughs> that are a pain and they stink. <laughs> so... But if Amen. you aren't sure, I want you to stand. I'm going to pray Praise for you God. real quickly. The bell will probably ring during this second prayer, but uh, anyway, we can go a few minutes longer. So if you're still debating, I just want you to stand. I'm going to pray this won't work if you're seated. If you're still debating, you got to humble yourself and stand to get this. So Father, we just pray for them and we want your will. Father, and I know that there's many different ways that you lead people, but if you're leading them here, I pray that every confusing thought is gone. It says that you aren't the author of confusion, but of peace. And I believe that you just speak to them and give them a supernatural peace. We are your sheep. We hear your voice. And we stand on James 1, 5, that if anybody lacks wisdom, all they have to do is ask of God and you'll give it. And we don't waver in our faith. We believe that you are speaking and showing them exactly if they're supposed to be here or someplace else, or maybe they're supposed to come some other time. We just thank you, Father, and we receive it and believe that they're leaving here with a peace in their heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all agree with that? Amen. Amen. All right, so for those of you who have made the decision to come, stand, and we want, you, we want to pray with you and believe that God is going to work everything out. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So, Carrie, you pray over all of these that have made the decision to come. Well, Father, I thank you that we hear your voice and another we will not follow. And Lord, I thank you that because we know your voice, Lord, there is peace in it. There is provision in it. So, Father, I just thank you for this new season, this life-changing season each and every one are getting ready to enter into. And Lord, I just thank you for excitement within their heart. Amen. And when things try to rise up, when they go back home and people tell them, what, are you crazy? They're able to say yes for Jesus. And so, Amen. Father, I thank you that they will not thank listen to Jesus. other people's voices or opinions or situations' you, voices. And so, Father, I thank you that like... Uh, Andrew said, they're not going to turn away, but Lord, it is for such a time as this. And because they're standing, because of this season, there's going to be supernatural healings. 
There's going to be supernatural prosperity. There's going to be supernatural provision in relationship. Things that have been broken are going to be restored. And we just prophesy that. And we prophesy to all the things that are coming and that you have it by your hand. And so, Father, we just speak a blessing. Just protect them as they go forward and as they come back. Lord, we bless you. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Woo! We're so excited.